Welcome, everybody. Um, I'm really excited to be able to introduce our speaker for this session. Um, there's a story here. <clears throat> many, many years ago, I went to hear an Appalachian storyteller, and I was very surprised that the stories she told as an Appalachian woman um, were stories of living in Chicago. Because before that, I had never known that there was a huge um, outflux of Appalachians and other Southern folk um, into Chicago for jobs. And I didn't know that had been a thing. And then if we fast forward a few years, um, I lived in Chicago for a year, that didn't stick. Um, but while I was there, I, I couldn't find out anything about that point in time. Um, and then a couple years later, I hear about the Rainbow Coalition and I'd never ever heard about that before. And so this has been this uh, kind of journey to figuring out the players in this um, wonderful organization. So today we have with us High Thurman. Um, High Thurman was a one of those um, Appalachian Southern diaspora folks that were living in the 60s in Chicago as a young man. And um, he was originally from Tennessee. He's now in Alabama. Um, he was one of the co-founders of the Young Patriots Organization. And that was a group of displaced Southern white youth. And they provided services in their community for healthcare and um, children's breakfast programs and urban um, fought against urban renewal plans that would destroy their homes. Um, and then um, they partnered with the Black Panther Party and um, the Young Lords and created the first Rainbow Coalition. Um, he's done all kinds of organizing throughout his whole life. And ex excitingly enough, he has a brand new book that just came out. And um, I want to know the name of it. I want to say Hillbilly Revolutionary or I just exited out by accident. Um, so he has a great new book out that I have ordered and I can't wait to read. And I am really excited for all of us to hear about his exciting life in community organizing. Hi, welcome. Hi, you're muted. It's a pleasure for me to be here. Uh, I always enjoy, you know, talking to the youth these days and you know, some of them don't believe that I was actually young at one time, and uh, and uh, you know, I was I was uh, raised in somewhat in Dayton, Tennessee. Um, you know, probably not far from you, but uh, and uh, that was a um, we were raised in extreme poverty. Uh, if you know, in the book we talk about. I talk about how we used to have to pool our resources to eat because we were basically, you know, field workers. And why I became a radical revolutionary was because of poverty and the oppression that we went through in our town. And also what happened in Chicago when I migrated to went to Chicago to find a better job at 17. I was 17 years old. And um, there was a lot of police harassment, extremely poor community. If those of you have seen the first Rainbow Coalition, you'll, you'll begin to see a little bit of that. But there was just all kinds of, uh, of brutality going on. Uh, which is still going on in Chicago today. Uh, we were per, we were basically a prime area, a white community of poor Southern whites. There was many, up to one point is 80,000 people in and out of Chicago, uptown community at one time from the South. There were 40,000 people who sort of called it their permanent residence. Uh, <coughs> And so we were, we were entirely disrespected by, you know, by the uh, Mayor Daley's regime, uh, who Mayor Daley himself had came up through a gang, uh, and he knew he knew about gangs, and you know he was treating us as gangs, 
Um, and so his police force, Chicago police, basically was his gang. And he could get them, uh, control them to do anything that he wanted them to do. You know, the community itself, uh, Uptown was at, at one time the richest community in Chicago. It was built to be the entertainment district. But un and unfortunately for some people, those of us that had to move out, uh, it's gone back to being that entertainment district because of urban renewal and gentrification. Um, it's very hard to even get an apartment there for less than $3,000 a month. <clears throat> it's just certainly something that, that, we, uh, that we could not afford. And so I arrived at the age of 17. Um, I had a brother who was there and he had been involved in a local street gang called the Peacemakers. And uh, uh, he had been influenced by some students for a democratic society that came in uh, to the community to help people find jobs, but soon determined that uh, there were more, many more problems than jobs. And so um, basically, you know, he and he and some of the others that were uh, that were in this gang sort of were hanging around and joined, it's called Jobs or Income Now, which was started by SDS. Um, you know, they started hanging out, you know, basically because of the, well, put it this way, the young college student women, you know, attracted them to to this uh, this organization. But at the same time, uh, they were beginning to develop an ideology, political ideology, through uh, through the uh, teachings of 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 some of the uh, of those college students there and community organization organizing. So they already knew how to organize, uh, but because of the the political ideology of the Students for a Democratic Society, they were able to pick up on a lot of the other political um, ideologies and begin to organize. And uh, well, one of their first uh, endeavors was, and this was before I got there, uh, was to lead a march on the police station for police brutality. Uh, the police were literally murdering people. Uh, they were raping women. Uh, they were, uh, you know, it, it didn't, they hated Southern people. Uh, they hated poor people because that's why they were put there by Mayor Daley to keep this community and other, you know, other poor communities, even of color under, under control. Uh, that's the way he controlled the city. And so several of the members were actually, you know, murdered by the Chicago Police Department. It was blatant murder, but no one was ever ever uh, brought to justice because of it. And uh, they let a march on the local police station. And after that, that period of time, I came, that's when I came to Chicago and uh, all hell broke loose. You know, they were, they, uh, the police raided the joint office and some of the other offices of SDS and busting down doors of people and literally, uh, beating people and acting like a Gestapo. And, uh, and so uh, I came to Chicago my about my second or third week in Chicago and I was very green, you know, I was, I was up there reading like on the third grade level. I, I had no skills at all, but I had also been mistreated in my hometown uh, because um, they were the police, uh, the cops there and the, the you know, the city, uh, hierarchy, uh, would arrest, you know, poor, poor people and, and sentence them to jail, uh, terms, you know, on false arrest. If, uh, if someone from an upper class or middle class had committed a crime, uh, they're the ones that had all the power within the, within the community. And this was in Dayton, Tennessee. Um, uh, they would automatically just go and pick up, you know, one of us that were poor 
Uh, many of many of us went to jail, and many of us were very mistreated by the police, uh, and and by the the establishment at that time. And so, this is why I decided to go to Chicago because of the oppression, the police brutality, and the oppression. And so I arrived in Chicago, which is you know just a, a ghetto. It was terrible. Uh, the living conditions in this community was just terrible. And at one time, as I was saying, it was meant to be a, uh, a the diamond uh, showcase for the uh, Chicago. And uh, you know, it has still has the Aragon Ballroom. Anybody that was anybody played there. There's Frank Lloyd Wright home there. Uh, it still hosts the, uh, the the bar, Green Mill of, of uh, Al Capone, uh, you know, and even the Essenary Studios, which belonged to Charlie Chaplin, is still there. Uh, it was the, the end of the uh, elevated train stop, and, and it was an entertainment district. But what happened, uh, and it was the second, it was the Hollywood at that time. This is where all the movies basically were made. So because of the the end uh, the exodus into the community out of the community into the suburban areas um, many people families moved out into the suburban areas into the subdivisions because they wanted to get into a more safe stable neighborhoods out of chicago and and also at that time um the movie industry relocated to California and left a lot of vacant buildings uh, that could not be re-inhabited by, you know, wealthy people. And so a lot of these uh, buildings were cut up into efficiency apartments. There were some already there because of the uh, migratory uh, transit uh, population of, of people working in the, in the movie industry. So essentially what happened was it became over time, you know, um, a mecca for, you know, poor people from all over the world. They were able to, to move into these apartments uh, at a cheap, you know, very cheap price weekly or daily and rental. And so it became a ghetto, uh, a, a very rundown ghetto because uh, the landlords that owned the buildings were not about to put money into them. Uh, some of them sold them to very uh, ruthless other landlords. And so it became, it became a, a magnet for people from all over the world actually to live there, poor people. And when you get in, and, and because of the conditions in the South at that time, uh, I'm talking about the 50s, 60s, you know, 70s, with the, the mines being closed down, the mechanization of the farms, uh, and the textile mills. Uh, a lot of people didn't have a job, so they migrated, which was created the migrant circle. And that was uh, people going to Chicago, Detroit, you know, Cincinnati, Philadelphia. Uh, to find jobs and and once you get into those communities like uptown you find out that you don't have the skills for the jobs and the city wasn't about to create anything for you uh, Roger Guy has a book out called from diversity to unity which talks about um, the pop the unemployment uh, rate for the uptown community was 47 percent and that was there were more people living, poor people living in the community without skills than there were jobs in Chicago. Uh, and there were very few services for them. And uh, so um, people were living in un all kinds of conditions, uh, lead poisoning in the buildings. Uh, you know, the police were sent in to, to control the people uh, to keep people, you know, from uh, from rioting or demanding services, and so by the '60s, uh, uh, the community had become uh, somewhat volatile, you know, for organizing and violence. Uh, 
you know, so and started making demands. And so SDS came in at a proper time to start organizing. And so that brings in, uh, when I got there, my first, uh, well, my first encounter with the, with the Chicago Police Department, uh, you know, Daly had kept communities separated. He kept people separated because that's how he controlled the communities. Um, uh, I was, uh, I was, well, as an example, uh, I was stopped by the, the police and uh, uh, cops threw me in the back of the car. Uh, and what they were looking for, they were looking for someone to be a burglar for them. Uh, because in 1959, the local police station had been uh, busted by the FBI for selling stolen goods out of their police department, out of the Somerdale Police Department, drugs and prostitution. Uh, they were very corrupt. They had, some of them had their own personal burglars that if someone was caught committing a crime, they would make them a burglar and they'd have to go and steal goods for them. And that was proven when uh, a detective busted a, a, a professional burglar and made him his, his, his personal burglar and, uh, and would take orders of items that he'd have to go steal for them. Uh, but uh, he was busted, this, the burglar was busted by a, a cop who didn't know what was going on. And so this cop turned state's evidence and got this police department busted by the FBI uh, and and they were um, eight policemen were found guilty and the, the commissioner himself had to resign. <coughs> Excuse me. But that's what we were dealing with. We were dealing with police like this. We were dealing with, you know, uh, brutal brutality, murder, rape, you know, everything you can imagine coming out of these police out of the police department because at that time um, they would get the most psychotic or crazy dangerous violent cops and put them into the poor communities the other stable cops would go into the what they would consider to be the more stable communities and so that was their way of controlling the poor people because Daly had made a statement that there's no slums in Chicago, which we all know there were. And so, but anyway, getting back to the point of what turned me, uh, what, what really turned me at that time was uh, the cops had stopped me. They put me in the back of the car and they wanted me to be their burglar. Uh, and of course, you know, I refused. I didn't know what was going on. And uh, when the cop had, one of the, one of the cops had, heard my southern dialect uh he said oh no not another fucking hillbilly you know you know you we don't want you to trash here he said why don't you go back home and fuck your mother or your dog or your pig or whatever you people fuck down there we don't want you here and so that and he said uh let me see your identification and i only had so security card, you know, I wasn't old enough for the selective service at that time. And he said, uh, well, do you want to buy an ID? Because he was selling false IDs. And, and of course I didn't. And uh, they both kicked me out of the car, you know, they had already had me handcuffed, you know, they put one of them put their foot on my head, the other one on my back and, and sat on my back and, and you know, and, and took the handcuffs off and then proceeded to kick me. And they said, if we see you around here anymore, we won't be as nice. Well, that's about when I figured out that, hey, <laughs> I don't think these people are my friends. But the other idea about, uh, I always thought that Chicago would be the, the, the promised land. Believe me, there's no promised land there. Uh, I always saw it as, as being, you know, the gangster, the romantic type, the, you know, the, uh, the, 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 the movie stars and all that. Well, they were there, but they just were not in Uptown. 
And so that's when I started becoming more radical. And, uh, uh, and around that time, the Peace and Freedom Party of California came in and they were running um, Eldridge Cleaver as president of the United States. And Eldridge Cleaver, you, of course, he you knows the Black Panther. And they wanted a white person to run as vice president. And they picked Peggy Terry, who was, Peggy Terry is a very well-known organizer at that time in the community. She was a former KKK member. Uh, she got involved with SNCC and uh, she was a poor white welfare mother. And was, that's a poster behind me. If you look over my shoulder, it says, time to fight. That's her poster from her presidential campaign, vice presidential campaign. So we were invited to partake, participate in, a, in a, uh, a presidential election at that age. I was 17 years old, 18 years old. And most of us uh, who got involved in it, well, some of them were even younger, some of them were 14 years old. You know, but we were we were a group of people who were fighting for our community because Uptown was under the influence of, of the urban renewal program at that time. And they wanted to tear down all the buildings and replace them. Um, and so we became we became what was called uh, the Young Patriots at that time because we felt that the young patriots were, you know, patriot, patriotism was something that all the way back to the Revolutionary War, that, you know, the patriots fought against oppression from England, you know, as, as I can say, we, we, we didn't know a lot about radical politics at that time, but we were learning. So we thought that, well, we were fighting for our community, although we had become revolutionaries at that point, and we become radical. Uh, we did see ourselves as patriots. And so that's how we became the Young Patriots. Uh, and we joined in with other groups uh, at that time. And over a period of time, the Young Patriots, as young as we were, became the spokespeople for the community. Uh, speaking of the urban renewal program, um, uh, we got together with other groups and, and put together a people's village alternative to to the uh, urban renewal program because Mayor Daly had always changed communities by bringing in institutions like colleges and and uh, and museums uh, and, and and put them in into these poor communities as a way of gent starting gentrification. Uh, he's doing the same in the community now with the Obama Museum. Uh, and, and so we, um, we were fighting against that because we, would, we didn't have any place to go. And so we, we started what was called the People's Village, which later on became known as the Hank Williams Village because of the Southern people that lived there. And we were a self, it would be a self-contained community. Uh, we would have our own free health clinics, we'd have our own, uh, you know, breakfast programs, we'd have our own library, we'd have our own city hall, we'd have our own, in a hotel where people were coming coming into the community, could stay until we could find them a job. We developed what was called the Tri-Faith Employment Program, which local churches uh, funded a program to find people jobs. Uh, and so we were involved in a lot of different programs. Um, and then we were recognized as by the, uh, basically by the Black Panthers. Uh, because we had been involved in this presidential campaign and that we were um, we were radicalized at that time and we were talking about you know self-determination in our community we had been studying the black panthers we've been studying you know also the young lords which was a, a hispanic gang turned political run by jose chacha Jimenez and the Black Panthers, which was run by Bobby Rush and Fred Hampton. And Rush, of course, is a sitting congressman today. Um, and so they invited us into a coalition with them because we had, 
we had the same values as them, although uh, we were Southern white. Uh, and, uh, but, but they thought, and I asked Fred Hampton, I said, why in the world would you ever wanna invite somebody like us into, into a coalition with, with Black Panthers and the Young Lords? Because, you know, we repressed, we come from a culture where you were oppressed, you know, you were treated as property, you were sold, bought and sold. You know, my God, we raped your women. You know, we killed, we hung your men. You know, we were white supremacists. Why in God's name would you want us to be a part of your coalition? And Hampton was, was very, very intelligent. He had thought about a lot of things. And he said, because of what you're doing and the type of organizing you're doing, and you're fighting anti-racism, uh, and uh, we, we can't have a revolution without you. He said, but we have to have more like you. And so you have to go out and you have to organize your people and you have to fight against white supremacy and you have to fight against, uh, you know, racism. And, and I said, although we're wearing a Confederate flag uh, because we use the Confederate flag um, as a way of trying to get into the, the white supremacy, uh, the, 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 the racism within the community. Uh, we would have a flag, a patch of a flag, and uh, we would put a free Huey button next to it or, you know, black power or, you know, free Puerto Rico, you know, or any of the third world countries at the time. And it would brought up conversations. And so we went into the bars, other meetings in the communities, and it would bring up conversations. Why do you have a flag, you know, a Confederate flag here with, with these types of buttons on it and stuff? And so it would give us an opportunity to talk to people about racism and what that flag meant and to try to convince and talk to these people that, you know, it's not really a part of heritage. It's, it, it's a symbol of hate, you know, and that it's, it's a symbol that was developed by slaveocracy. It was a symbol that was created by, you know, the slave owners. And it wasn't the flag that was really representative of all the people because it, it oppressed a lot of white people too. And, and we would talk about that. Uh, and, and I remember one occasion where uh, there was a man that uh, was extremely racist within the community. We knew him, he was a KKK member. Um, you know, also an American Nazi member, uh, got into a conversation with him, me and a couple of other people and uh, of the Young Patriots. And I had asked him a question. I said, no, I'm asking a question here about, uh, I, I know that you're a racist individual. I know that, you know, you, you know, uh, you, you, you don't care too much for people of color. I said, but you have children, right? And he said, yes, we do. And Yes, I do. And I said, well, what, ha what would be happen if your child needs a transplant, needs some kind of an organ transplant? And if you didn't get it right away, your child would die. And the only person that had that transplant organ would be a black person or another person of color. Would you accept that? And without hesitation, he said, you're damn right it would. And I said, well, <laughs> why are you treating black people and white and other people of color different? We're all the same inside. We all were all the same, except that you're making an issue of this color. Well, you know, he became one of our great supporters after that, because he began to see, you know, what he, he was, he wouldn't go out there with us, but he would support us. Uh, 
and so I don't think we we have to confront those issues. We have to confront those issues in people, uh, even though our lives are at stake, and they were at stake. I mean, we were we were you know beaten and jailed, and you know I remember cops coming to my door, and I've told this before, uh, knocking on the door in the middle of the night, and. Uh, I said, who's there? And they said, the Chicago Police Department opened up. And I said, what do you want? And well, they just put a key in my door and opened up. They had a key to my apartment. And they could come in at any time. And so many of us were, were beaten. Uh, but, you know, I guess what we're talking about here is that we were trying to educate people to class struggles. Uh, at the same time, we were talking about racism and, and racial problems within the world and in our, in our community. And so we were able to, even back as far as 1960, well, 68, 69, when we were uh, first talking with the Black Panthers, there's a movie called Re American Revolution II that was made about the documentary about how Blacks and uh, the hillbillies were making coalitions. And that brought on a lot of problems for us too within the community and throughout the country because uh, two of our members, uh, one went to Georgia for a vacation after this movie was released. And uh, the, the FBI was kept tabs on us all the time. Uh, the FBI had informed the locals that John Howard, you know, was uh, was in town, and he was only on seeing his family, and he was in a bar, and it was recorded that uh, somebody had made a statement that, you know, there's that end lover from Chicago. Uh, a couple of days later, he was found dead. Uh, his throat was cut. He was thrown off in a ditch. Uh, we had another member who. Um, went back to Virginia, West Virginia, to, to start a free health clinic. They found him shot execution style. Um, even the young lords, um, there was a young lords, the pastor that worked with them, Pastor Douglas, uh, had been warned by the police not to work with the young lords. Uh, he and his wife were found murdered stabbed multiple times right in front of their children. Uh, we had members that were shot down in the street. Uh, Mayor Daly had brought in the COINTELPRO FBI because he was afraid that we were going, he was afraid of this coalition. He was afraid that because of our free health clinics and food programs uh, that we were influencing the community and he wouldn't have control because we were beginning to chip away at that racial barrier that separated all the communities. We were able to work together. And so even, even the, the selective service was involved in this. Uh, we had a member named uh, Tom Malier who uh, was arrested at an anti-war demonstration, anti-Vietnam War demonstration in which we would go to and organize, um, uh, was arrested and, and the front page of the paper or newspaper, one of them in Chicago said, Tom Lamar, and his name was Tom Lamar, Lamar. And a few day, weeks later, he got a draft notice under Tom Lamar. And we knew that they were working together. So they were trying to bust us up everywhere they could uh, so the COINTELPRO, uh, Mayor Daly called in the FBI because he was afraid that we were gaining power. And he actually came out with a statement that, um, that, you know, condemned us. And so um, he was able to, to convince uh, you know, Mayor Daly that, I mean, uh, uh, Jared Hoover, that actually we were a threat to national security. This has all been documented. 
documented uh, that that uh, the FBI uh, uh, memo uh, stated that that the young patriots, uh, young lords, SDS, and uh, and the Black Panthers were a threat to national security. Mayor Daley also declared war on gangs, in which he classified us as being, you know, uh, people that were were deceiving the community. You know, so we had a lot going against us, and even the aldermen or the councilmen or people call them different different things uh, was involved. Uh, he would ride around with the cops and caught me one night and, and you know, uh, he and the other cops and, and told me that, you know, they were coming to get us and the young patriots and, uh, you know, beat me with his billy club and, and then he found an article or a picture on our door and said that Mayor Daly was a, uh, inciting riots at the, at the Democratic National Convention and said that uh, we we're an organization that needed to be watched. Uh, and so from there, what we did was, we, you know, I mean, we, we, we organized in the community. The Hank Williams Village never got approved, but we did raise money. We raised a quarter of a million dollars back then for this village. It could have been, if you look it up, it's, it's called a, a, the best housing program that ever was. And so we were a part of a organizing. We didn't just talk, we organized. And so that brought on a lot of a lot of hostility. And after Fred Fred Hampton was assassinated, uh, the Chicago Police Department and the FBI were found guilty twice in two uh, civil courts of conspiring to murder Fred Hampton. And and so all of our um, all of our records, uh, newspaper articles on the Rainbow Coalition was sealed. FBI documents, everything that they could find was sealed and stored away in the Chicago History Museum for about 40 years because they didn't want the fact that hillbillies and blacks you know, and Hispanics and Orientals and American Indians were all working together. They just did not want that to get out at that time. And that's been a statement by some FBI, some FBI agents at that time and, and stating that they thought that we were out to get them. So they had to destroy us, which put a lot of stress on a lot of us. And we had to kind of go on our own way. Uh, but we did develop a lot of programs within the community. And we were, uh, we were very effective because even though uh, the Rainbow Coalition, they tried to destroy the Rainbow Coalition, it lived on and its, uh, its legacy lived on and its politics lived on to the point where later on, uh, because of the Rainbow politics uh, and the Rainbow Coalition platform, uh, Bobby Rush, was elected as congressman, uh, and he's still a sitting congressman. Um, the first black mayor of Chicago was elected, Harold Washington, and that brought a guy named Barack Obama to Chicago. And he and Axel, uh, Axel Rod, uh, you know, um, developed a program out of that, with using that to propel him to the White House. Uh, and that's been, you know, documented by a book called From the Bullet to the Ballot by Jacoby Williams. And so most of us, you know, we, we left. Uh, most of us had to leave and, and just travel around the country and go underground and everywhere we would go, we, you know, we encountered problems, a lot of problems. But uh, some of us that are still around, there's only about a handful of, you know, five, I'd say five young patriots around at this point that were in leadership that are still alive. Uh, some of us are still involved in trying to, 
you know, trying to uh, complete the legacy of the Rainbow Coalition. And, uh, and so we're still developing programs. Um, and so I have been involved in what's called the North Alabama School for Organizers, uh, in which we try to train people to be organizers, but also try to uh, enhance the skills and the abilities of, of uh, the uh, organizer. Uh, I guess I can leave it at that. I don't take it all the time, but uh, you know, we could have some questions here if you want. Thank you, Mr. Thurman. Um, yeah, so we'll go ahead and open up for some questions. If anyone would like to unmute themselves and ask a question or put it in the chat, we'll be happy to read your question for you. Hi, Mr. Thurman. Uh, my name is Maggie Overman. Um, I uh, have lived in Chicago um, for two years and I studied at Loyola um, social justice and community development. And um, I'm currently the civic engagement coordinator here at Emory and Henry. Um, I have a funny question for you. I don't know if it's, uh, I just want to, I'm just curious. Do you happen to know Susan Rands? Did you ever know Susan Rands? The name is very familiar. I don't. Okay. I just was curious. Um, she was one of my professors and she was very yeah. active in community organizing. So I just wanted to ask. But, yeah. um, and also, did you ever meet uh, Saul Linsky? Yes. Yeah, we we met Saul Alinsky several times as he was organizing the back of the yards. Uh, now he also had talked Bobby Lee, who was uh, one of the the Black Panthers that came in and helped organize, uh, you know, helped organize us as far as the the, the coalition. Uh, Saul Alinsky saw something in him and and actually paid for his education at Northeastern Illinois University. Uh, we did. We did have a lot of talks. Uh, although our our philosophy at that time was a little bit more radical than his, uh, we were able to talk. And but I don't think we ever really worked on any programs together because he was on he was on the south side of Chicago, and we were more on the north side of Chicago. Yeah. Thank you very much for your sharing. I appreciate Thank it. You. Mr. Thurman, this is Sharon Bowers. I had an emergency, so I might have missed uh, you saying this. So if I have, please apologize. But have you spoken to the connection between your coalition and uh, PUSH coalition, if any, with Jesse uh, Jackson? Well, yeah, Rainbow PUSH. Uh, yeah, uh, the problem, there, there was a little bit of a problem there. Now, we did work with Jesse Jackson through Operation Breadbasket and uh, through, you know, PUSH. Um, his coalition, um, you know, we did work together. He had, a, you know, he had used, uh, it was, well, first of all, it was push. And then he used, uh, the, the rainbow push, co push coalition, whatever, uh, as adopting that name. Uh, although there was some controversy with, with, uh, Reverend Jackson, because he, patented the name Rainbow Coalition. And so that was that was a controversy. Uh, but yes, we did work with him on several occasions. Uh, you know, in Chicago, you know, helping to support some of his causes. He was in Uptown uh, in the earlier years when we were beginning to organize, uh, which was called the Uptown Area People's Planning Coalition. And so he was in and out of Uptown. He worked more with the Reverend Chuck Gary uh, at that time. But yeah, I knew we knew we knew uh, Reverend Jackson, and uh, and did work with him on some occasions. Thank you. There's a question in the chat. Um, how did you personally keep up your spirits while going through all of this? Recreational drugs. No, <laughs> we, uh, we had a camaraderie, you know, of people. Uh, we had people from, you know, from really all over the country that we knew and we could, 
you know, we could rely on and, 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 and the, the spirits would get really low sometime within us because of all the stress. But, you know, we, we, we looked at the, we looked at the cause of what we were about. Uh, and we looked at what we were doing at the time. Uh, you know, we were just living from day to day, like everybody else, trying to make a living. You know, uh, some, some folks had families they were trying to support. Uh, but we knew that what we were doing was important at the time. And, uh, you know, we could have we could have gone and joined the Democratic Party or whatever. Uh, but we chose to, you know, to fight for the people in the community. Because th those were the people that were very important to us. And, you know, if you see children with malnutrition and people, children with lead poisoning and you know, see uh, people with black lung disease and uh, brown lung disease from the textiles, you know, and you see people dying from pneumonia and you see people who were neglected and, 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 uh, and, and refused, you know, certain uh, things that should be given to people, you know, uh, the health care, for instance, uh, you know, it just, uh, uh, and any time that you would, we would develop a program uh, that would help these people, it kind of gave us a boost, you know, that we were doing something important, I think. Because, you know, you look at it, most of us were, were very uneducated academically, uh, you know, but, but life-wise, uh, you know, we were young, but we were so far ahead of, of other, you know, of other, uh, I guess, uh, kids our age because we didn't have a childhood. We skipped the childhood and started right into adulthood. So uh, that, you know, that kept us going because we didn't, we didn't think as a child. We, we thought as, as adults because it was, a, it was all a matter of survival mode that you'd go into. Um, so you speak on your age quite a bit um, and the age of um, the other people um, that were a part of this coalition. Um, do you believe that your age and your peers' age um, impacted your ability to reach more voters during this time? Do you think they looked down on you for the age that you were? Oh, absolutely. We were looked down on. We would go to meetings and uh, our other, you know, just uh, encounters uh, with people that were older than us. And we had a problem at the beginning uh, because we would go to these meetings and, you know, these young kids coming in and um, they would want us to be there as far as numbers, I think. Uh, but as far as listening to us, they thought that we were too young and we couldn't understand, you know, the, the problems or come up with the solutions, uh, you know, that, that, that were in the community. And we disagreed with some of them maybe, uh, thought that, you know, they, they, they need to listen to more of the, the younger people in the community or, or different parts of the community, segments of the community. And, and so they, they wanted us to be there as far as their numbers support them, but a lot of our suggestions uh, they they would they would ignore or didn't think was important. So that that turned us off a lot. So at one point we said, "Well, we don't really need them. We can go do what we need to do. You know, we can develop these resources uh, because there were there were younger people uh, in the movement at that time that were doing the same thing. We weren't the only ones." You know, you look at the young lords, they were young. You know, a lot of the Black Panthers, they were young. Uh, a lot of the American Indians that were involved. You know, youth were getting involved all over the place. And so we weren't alone. You know, we were, we were a part of that youth movement, you know, that was, was trying to change things. And, and, and so we could, 
we could communicate between each other. And uh, we finally started making demands that they listen to us. And they listened to us only when we started taking over meetings. Uh, we were, we would go in and take over these urban renewal meetings or police, you know, uh, meetings, uh, you know, other meetings within the community that we thought were trying to, you know, damage us or trying to kick us out of our community. Um, and so we, we got to be noticed because we were doing that and the older population of people were not doing that. They were too busy talking and the rhetoric, you know, kind of got in our way where we thought that we needed to, you know, we, we needed action more than talking. And uh, most of, you know, been in jail anyway, so it didn't make any difference you got arrested. You know, you just kind of looked at it, you got on the street, you're going to get arrested at some point. So it really didn't, and, you know, <laughs> we knew that, you know, uh, we were going to be beaten at some point. So it really didn't make any difference, but it made a lot of difference to the older people that, that they were going to take that chance. I'd like to call on Casey Curry. I saw him raise his hand, so I just wanted to make sure he got a chance to ask his question. Thank you. Um, so my question sort of goes along with the question in the chat. But I was wondering, like, um, how, like, if you have any advice for radical left anti-racist organizing in the modern rural Appalachia, rural South, where you know the state mm -hmm. seems pretty depressed for it right now. Yeah. Well, the only thing I'd say is um, you have to understand people's values and where they're coming from. You know, uh, sort of like uh, if if we're looking at the people who you know who, who tried you know take over the Capitol building, for instance. Uh, you have to look at their values and see where those values come from and why they were doing it. It certainly was just a, a small part of the population that did that. Um, these are these are people that have been you know radicalized at some point. But you have to understand people's values and uh, allow people to express themselves and to talk about it. You know, I might not. You know, I might not agree, you know, you know, I certainly don't agree with Trump philosophy, uh, but that doesn't stop me from talking to people. That doesn't stop me from, from looking at their values and talking to them about it. I was at a, a, a woman's um, a demonstration recently and uh, there were uh, high school kids showed up with Trump signs. Uh, there are about 15 of them there. And uh, and so I said, well, somebody needs to talk to these these kids, you know. Um, you know, they, they're thinking a certain way and they've gotten these values, you know, certainly from their, their environment. And so what kind of environment do they have? And, and, and so um, a couple of us grabbed some literature from the Poor People's Campaign and went over and uh, approached them and said to them that, you know, even though we understand that you support Donald Trump, you know, uh, it's obvious that we don't. And we're very honest about it. Uh, don't you feel it's your obligation to help the poor and the marginalized people in this country and, and they said, well, yes, it is. And they said, okay, well, there's a commonality that we have. Um, don't you feel that you should question why these people are hungry and why these people are poor? You know, don't you think that you should try to look into that and try to figure out why? Um, because all you see is, what most people see is it comes to in terms of, of say the poor people uh, is that they, they look at 
poor people as being poor, a lot of them because they choose to be poor or, you know, they could be a victim of circumstances, but they don't look beyond why they're poor or why they are victim of circumstances. And, and I think we have to kind of reverse that and look at, you know, the, the people that are Trump supporters, for instance. Why are they that way? How did they get that way? You know, and who are they? And what are their values? Because I think it'd be an injustice just to say that, you know, we hate them all. You know, they can't be, that they can't be turned. I think they can. And I think a lot of them can. I just think that they're, they're in an environment of, raised in an environment of, of hate. And I think uh, we're, we, we can help turn that. Uh, and so uh, their values are very, very important to them as, as our values are to us. So I think we need to respect their values, not necessarily go along with their values, but show them that we respect them as a person. And then I think we can begin to turn, we can begin to turn, you know, people and organize people. I hope that answers it. But. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. We're coming up on the, uh, the hour here. So um, we have time for maybe one more question if anybody wants to ask. Um, okay, one came up in the chat. Mr. Thurman, what would you want to see young people and others do better in today's time as far as protesting, marching, and raising awareness towards police brutality and racism? Well, I think what we're doing now is, um, is very important to show in numbers. I think unless you, you know, you have to, with, it, with the establishment that it is now, you have, you have to show some numbers. But you also have to understand then getting back to those values of, of say, you know, where you live in terms of your city council, in terms of, you know, in, in terms of the, you know, the, the, the powers that be, you know, and who are those powers that be. Um, and, and you have to work from there, you know, because there's not going to be a revolution or revolution soon. You know, on either side, we know that. Uh, but there's going to be a lot of contention between groups. And so there's times when we have to use hostility and there's times when we should not use it. I would think that if, if we go to, for instance, our, our, our city council meetings or, or whatever, and, and we demand that it begin to have an end to police brutality, that the police department changes. Well, it ain't necessarily gonna do that through hostility a lot of times, sometimes it does. But we have to understand that we're gonna have to do some work. We're gonna have to organize. And if these are people that, you know, that, that are damaging our community, we're gonna have to, we're gonna have to organize to get people in office. It's gonna, you know, going to fight uh, against police brutality. I think we have to keep documenting like we do now with our phones and, and all that. I think we need to get more into getting more legal services. I, I don't see uh, a lot in legal services these days. But to be challenged, when, when they're challenged legally, it makes a, a lot of difference than if they're just being challenged by uh, a group of people, you know, because you're talking about laws, laws that affect them. So, you know, there should be more, more community uh, legal services, should be more lawyers or even paralegals, you know, fighting, uh, you know, this, this system. And other than just going in and taking over a police department, I, you know, a lot just ain't going to happen. 
unless we can document, unless we can uh, we can keep persisting that um, that they're not they're not like longer going to control us. That we're going to control them, you know. So that would be the you know some of the answer to my question. But you know, I'd be glad to continue talking to people, you know, uh, you know, or my email or phone or whatever, you know. So, but um, anyway, I, I thank you for allowing me to be here today.